controversial questions that are important and raising the conversation and seeing how we as an island can work through and think about our future in the long term. Um, my background is um, I 
uh, undergraduate work the cultural anthropologist then I got a degree in education and teaching and did that and then I um, law so I'm an attorney and now a politician so um, your servant government official <laughs> So you can see we have a wide representation. We have two gentlemen from the academic community in the agriculture field, we have one business person, and we have one very strong community member who is very interested in all things that happen on our island. So now we're going to follow with asking some <coughs> questions of these folks. And in order to set the tone for what we're going to be talking about this evening and making sure that we're all sort of on the same page, if you will, we're going to find out what is genetic modification? What is genetic modification? I and mean, I think everybody right now probably has a whole different concept if you ask yourself that question. What do you think it is? So we're going to start with Mr. Ha, and we're going to ask him to take approximately three minutes uh, to tell us what in his understanding is genetic modification. Then we'll follow with Dr. Nagata, and we'll go come, come across the table. These two gentlemen are on the pro side of the issue. These two folks are on the anti side of the issue at this point. Okay? All right. So we'll start with Mr. Um, first of all, I, I don't think pro GMO is a good, um, clear characterization of where I stand. I actually am pro science, and I'm willing to change my um, mind anytime as long as the science um, <clears throat> dictates that. Um, pretty much, I, I gotta give you some background so you, so you get some context as to how, why I feel the way I do. You know, we've been farming for 35 years, and as I mentioned, you know, it's not an easy thing to do, so what we've had to do was look into the future, 5, 10, 20 years, and, and figure out where we need to be relevant, and for us to change necessary to get us there. So, when, when I look at uh, GMOs, it, it, it's, a, it's a way, it's, another, it's just another tool. You know, if we we're talking about food security, which is what my subject is, food security, if we're looking at food security, GMOs is one of the tools that you use to get. Would you, if you would, please tell what is GMO? Okay. What is GMO? I'm, I'm not a scientist, I'm a farmer. Okay. I'm not going to give you a, a scientific explanation of DNA, RNA, and all that kind of stuff. But I have done a lot of research, and I know a lot of people. So the bottom line is when we're farming, we're looking at uh, sustainability as a buzzword that's easy to use. But our sustainability has to go, it has to be socially sustainable, needs to be environmentally sustainable, it needs to uh, be economic, you know, it must work economically. We need to have three of those conditions. As I said, you know, if it's within there, you know, maybe I'll, I'll just stop there. Anybody can ask me any questions, but I can assure you that I've done a lot of uh, looking into the subject and that I've read a lot, and if it fits, you can what I just said. What, are we asking the questions now? No. 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 Okay. I think he meant like afterwards or okay. the time. So if you do have a question, however, write them on your card and you can pass them over. Okay. All right, we're glad he's willing to be your safety on that. Thank you, Richard. All right, if you would please pass it to Russell now. And let Russell tell us what is GMO from a scientist perspective. All right, uh, as I mentioned, uh, in the introduction, I was trained as a plant breeder to do uh, plant genetics. And to me, you know, when we talk about genetic modification, you know, it is a process which is used to describe many different changes to the genetic code. And it involves a number of different processes. Uh, people turn that these are natural, these are not natural. But when it comes down, it is a change in the genetic code. When you look at the DNA or the genetic code that every living organism have, it comes down to base pairs of amino acids. There are four amino acids. Everyone has the same four amino acids, like it or not. You can say it's different, and by the order in which they appear on your chromosomes, or they form genes, bases, 
and that is the basis for genetics of every living organism. And, you know, when we look at that, you know, there are different ways, as we said, we're going to modify the genetics. There's many different ways, you know, to do that. We can, there's natural selection, uh, change in environment, climate, catastrophic events that can move the population in one direction or the other called genetic drift. Uh, there's mutations. Mutations are occurring at a constant rate in each one of us. Some of them lead to cancer, other leads to different characteristics. We all have different hair color, we have different eye color, skin pigmentation. All of these are controlled by genes or changes that were once, you know, changes in base pairs. We talk about natural, you know, genetic engineering or, you know, genetic modification. We have bacteria that are able to insert their genes into the host plant, co-opting their genetics to help them reproduce. Crown gall is one that I am referring to right now, and it is the one that molecular biologists have used to insert many of the characteristics that uh, we're talking uh, pesticide uh, resistance or, or pesticide uh, BT, or herbicide resistance. It is used as what we call a vector or a means to transfer DNA from a, to, well, from a source. Oh, 15 seconds. Okay, and but I'd like to just say it is a change, natural or you can consider it unnatural, but it is changes in the DNA. Thank you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Now, Dr. Valenzuela is going to present from his perspective what is GMO, and he GMO, and he is also a scientist. Uh, thank you for the panelists for showing up, and also thank you for putting this workshop together. In these simplest terms, uh, genetic modification consists of introducing genetic material from one species into a different species. Uh, this could be from a tomato into corn, it can be from an animal to, to a plant or to humans. Uh, one thing that I have to make clear is that a genetically modified crop is an artificial product created by humans, and it's an organism that has never before existed in nature. Uh, so it is a, 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 little, a little misleading uh, when the industry comes and claims that this is something that has occurred all the time. And when they come, say it's part of classical breeding and, and genes have always mixed. Uh, we do know that in nature, sometimes uh, species have mixed naturally, but this has taken place as part of evolution, as part of thousands of, of years. Uh, very rarely do genetic modification, and especially with a specific cassette as it's introduced today, exists in nature. And this is where skeptics come and say, this organism has never before existed in nature, and we need to determine, conduct the proper safety studies to make sure that there is no environmental or, um, or health uh, impacts on, on, on humans, uh, and we have to conduct the, uh, the, the proper studies to determine whether this is a risk to the community or not. The main problem is that we are dealing with a living organism and as such, if for any reason, five years, 10 years, 20 years down the road, we find that, oops, we made a mistake, this would be impossible to take back because we're dealing with living organisms. This may be in the environment, this may be in the mountains, in the, in the food chain, and it would be impossible uh, to track down. Uh, we often hear the claim that we're dealing with DNA. DNA is DNA and we eat DNA. Well, uh, you, you could try to tell that to somebody who is a, a victim of a, or a, who has got infected by macular disease, by prions. Uh, we know that the proper DNA combination or genetic combination can be fatal. Uh, we know that genes, when they interact, they can create toxins, secondary metabolites, and that these secondary metabolites could be highly toxic in many different ways and in ways that today we do not understand. Uh, this is something that we could realize 10 years later, 20 years later, and this is uh, what is uh, 
considered to be an unintended consequence. Unintended consequence is something that happens when we didn't think that it would happen. And just the, uh, an example uh, is the Fukushima accident in, in Japan, the nuclear accident. Uh, but we have seen it on and on with many different, many different cases. Thank you. Um, Margaret, Margaret Willey, and uh, basically GMOs, in, as I understand them, are living organisms whose genes have been manipulated in a way that's not natural, um, not naturally occurring in, na in nature, such as insertion of foreign genes along with various promoters and markers, um, and that our government, the federal government, the USDA treats as substantially equivalent to non, the corresponding non-GMO crop. And for that reason, that political decision led to the position by the federal government that they are exempt from health and safety testing that would otherwise be required. Um, and the GMO crops, which was my focus, um, that because GMO pollen or GM organisms are dominant, they contaminate um, non-GMO crops or non-GMO um, uh, uh, farm farms, as well as neighboring property owners' gardens um, for the corresponding crops. So you can pretty much, once they're there, become GMO dominant, and whether you like it or not, those trespassing, um, whether it's uh, pollen and also the pesticides, um, basically are on your neighboring non-GMO properties. And these GMOs are patentable. That means, that argument is that it's because they're so different despite the fact that at the federal level of approval, it's, they're argued to be substantially equivalent, <coughs> which to me is a clear contradiction. And these um, GMO crops or organisms are largely associated with pesticides and herbicides that are powerful, that sterilize the soil in many ways. So you really, in, I just want to take this one level higher and that is, what is the big picture? What are we really looking at in terms of us all controlling our destiny? And one is, we're at a pivotal point. Do we move more towards eco-friendly, working with the land, working with nature, and being part of that, that future? Or do we really continue on sort of a, how do we do a, um, you know, sort of a, a, a trick and move things short-term economics where maybe we're a, an adversary to the land. And that's how I see it sort of long-term. Um, I also want to say that GMO crops is also an issue of being largely controlled by super powerful, non-local uh, multinationals versus having um, biodiverse, small farm <coughs> egg. And in a way, turn independent farmers into serfs or controlled, largely controlled by the patent holder of those seeds. Thank you. All right, well, there we have some things, some issues laid out already. Now, we're going to give both positions a chance to talk for just one moment to each other. And I'm going to ask these folks to have a chance to rebut what these folks said, if there's any point that they made that you would like to take issue with and bring out another issue in regards to what they said, you can talk over who's going to reply to this, but you'll have uh, two minutes. And uh, the same with you folks. You can talk over uh, which one of you wants to reply to what these folks said. So take just a quick second to see who's going to reply. Oh, yeah, pass the, if you do have questions, please write them on the green cards. Say to whom you are addressing the question and pass them over to this aisle on this side. And you can do that all the way through the discussion. Okay? All right. So let's start with these gentlemen and let's see who's going to rebut what these folks had to say. Thank you. 
Okay, uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, first of all, talking about unnatural, that GMOs are unnatural. How many of you know that most crops that we use for food today are unnatural? They don't survive in nature. They don't survive one season to the next. Corn. Do we find any wild corn out there? No. There's no such thing as wild corn. We have teal scented, which is what is thought to be the parent of corn. It's out there. But there is no wild corn. Uh, we have a lot of crops that we said are like cucumbers or squash, but these are very, very small. And it took man thousands, tens of thousands, or 10,000 years to select for these types that we grow today. So, you know, those are unnatural because they are all human driven. They were selected by humans and kept because they had certain traits that were desired by individuals. Safety. Most of the world science organizations have endorsed the safety of genetically modified crops. It is a general consensus that they accept that they are safe and they are equivalent to their non-GMO part. Talking about, you know, patentable, you can patent any plant that has a single gene difference. That is the patent law. It's not only GMO plants that can be patented. Normally, conventionally bred crops can be patented. So when we look at the big picture here, I think it, it's you know safe to say that one, it is safe. Two, what is natural or unnatural? It is the choosing of those who describe the process. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, now, uh, which one of you is going to uh, okay? Uh, Dr. Valenzuela is going to then rebut some of the things that these gentlemen had to say. Thank you. So I, I would agree with uh, Margaret's position that the, the whole idea is how can we develop agricultural systems on the island to develop sustainability, to take care of the land, and to take care of the land so that it will be there for future generations. I think in terms of terminology, we have to differentiate the concept of domestication, where you develop a plant over thousands of years, and eventually you have something like corn, where it cannot live by itself on nature, as compared to the process of genetic modification, where overnight you create a new organism with a combination from several different species, viral species, bacterial species, and other species, and to create an organism that has never before existed in nature. Almost by default, without using the scientific process, the government decided we do not need to conduct safety studies on this product because we will consider them to be substantially equivalent. This is not a scientific definition, it was created based on policy by the government. And since then, we have allowed companies to provide information on a volunteering basis, whether they think there's a risk to humans or not. Uh, based on the evidence for the past 15 to 20 years, we're starting to document hard evidence that genetically modified organisms pose a reasonable human risk, uh, risk to human health and also to the environment. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now the next question is, and we'll, we'll start with you folks on the anti-position. Uh, the next question is, what are your worst fears of using genetic modif genetically modified crops on the Big Island of Hawaii? And then you gentlemen also, I know that you must have some thoughts, if taken in the extreme, what would be your worst fears of perhaps misuse of genetic modification. So we'll ask you to answer that question as well. So this time, uh, we'll start with Ms. Willie. Okay, worst fears. Uh, basically, irreversible damage to the environment and irreversible damage to people, especially the most vulnerable in this case, which is um, the very young and uh, prenatal. Um, that's where the, the greatest harm is. And what we're doing is we're setting up an experiment. We are the guinea pigs. Um, and that was basically how I saw looking around the world, whether it's Kauai, Latin America, India, um, in, in Asia, is 
where they're stopping. Like, we've been doing GMOs, and look what's happening. And look at Mexico did it. This is an imminent threat to the health and well-being of the nation. Um, moving, I feel we're moving in that direction. We're going for more and more super weeds. We're going for allowing higher and higher levels of toxicity, higher and higher residue, allowing for greater wind so it's more um, uh, the contaminants are go over a larger area. We don't do post-marketing monitoring or uh, health uh, reviews. And then moving down on another level, you have what about our home rule and county say so and what our future is. The whole effort on the other levels is to undermine that. Even on the federal level where they sought to protect um, the neighboring property owners who have volunteer trespassing seeds to put up some law that would protect them from uh, strict liability lawsuits by the biotax every effort, 2005, 2007, 2009, all of those efforts failed. So we do not have the protection on the federal and state level. And you really get down to the little counties where the people are in the communities that are really where they are not as controlled. Um, I also think in terms of the big picture, look around. You've got these seed companies that control 90 85, 90, 95 percent of key crops um, dominating. And I, I've gotten letters from farmers on the mainland or in Canada saying, we're doing GMO, but we can't get the other seeds. We want the non-GMO seeds. I mean, if, and if you just think about it, those who control the seeds control the food, control the people. So do we want large-scale multinationals here on this island dominating our agricultural policies, or do we want it to be the community and people based? Is that it? Okay, Dr. Helen Soyman, worst fears. So, uh, among the worst fears is that we will be taking attention away from what we should be thinking about, uh, which is how to create healthy and sustainable agricultural systems uh, for the islands to attain sustainability. Uh, all kinds of uh, national aid, international agencies are saying climate change is not is imminent, it's upon us. What are we going to do as communities to deal with, with those changes? Uh, by focusing on industrial methods of agriculture, on technology that is owned on, on a patent basis, we are almost taking our attention away from the focus on how to build up, take care of our land, build up healthy agricultural systems that we increase the economic sustainability of our communities. Among the risks or worst fears is that many of the symptoms that we're observing based on animal studies showing potential harm effects on several body organs will actually turn out to be true or to actually harm human health uh, down the road. Another angle is to realize the fact that GM crops are not a technology by themselves. Part of the technology involves the heavy application of pesticides. Almost 100% of the acreage of GM crops is based on pesticide use technology. Either you need to apply pesticide to make it work, or the product itself contains a pesticide. Uh, in Kauai and in Molokai over the past 15 years, we have gotten to almost our worst fears, living close to chemical companies that are spraying pesticides on your neighborhood on a daily basis, and also on dust escapes. Uh, the question mark is what will be the long-term effects of that level of exposure. We have very little understanding about the health effect of pesticides, and pesticide combinations on human health. And of course, the worst fears is that these will have strong impacts on, on our communities. Uh, in addition to impacts on what are called non-target organisms. Uh, we know that we have experienced pesticide declines uh, over the past 15 to 20 years and it is becoming increasingly <coughs> evident that pesticides seem to be playing a role on, on a pesticide decline. A, a paper just came out from Harvard University reinforcing uh, previous studies showing that pesticides may be involved. Uh, we know that a lot of the pesticides that are used by the GM industry, by the seed industry in Hawaii uh, are some of those pesticides that are involved on, 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 on pesticide decline. We know that the companies that are producing G crops are chemical companies that produce pesticides. So part of their technology is how can we continue to manufacture pesticides and to promote this technology 
uh, and the fears are, of course, uh, what we have seen in the past on and on again, many adverse effects on the population and on the environment. Thank you. Now, um, on your position, the positive side of things, I know that you must have concerns and uh, probably some of them in your minds have already been addressed, so why don't you talk about what you think worst fears are, and if you think that they have already been addressed, you can share that now too. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, you know, talking about my worst fears about GMO crops is that it will not be in our toolbox to use when we need it. You know, scientific data and the general consensus has been that it is safe. It is not a threat to society. If GMOs were that much of a problem, we would have papayas from heel all the way down into the Volcano National Park. How many wild or feral papaya trees do you see out there? Being GMO does not confer a selective advantage for survival out in the wild. And on top of that, what I fear is that any type of GMO or anti-GMO platform is based on misleading facts, misuse of data, or cherry picking of information to give a skewed view where, one, they cause disease such as cancer, diabetes, autism, and other human illnesses. I have a graph showing that a correlation of 99 or 0.99, which is very good, two lines on a graph. On one side of the graph, it shows organic produce sales. On the other side, it shows autism. Do I believe that the two have a cause and effect relationship? No, but the GMO or the anti-GMO side uses two lines on a graph and try to convince people that there is a cause and effect relationship when none exists at all. Thank you. Um, you know, from the farmer's point of view, this, this is one of my greatest fears. Um, we, we're all of us farmers are, are are want to, you know, do the best we can to grow food for everybody. But in this particular uh, environment, and I gotta agree with um, Dr. Nagata here because I've read it in different sources from different sources, and I talked to a lot of people. Um, you know, on the Big Island, we're geographically different than all of the other islands. First of all, the GMO companies are not going to come here. Why? Right? Because you, it, it, they make money on uh, industrial scale agriculture, which requires flat land irrigation, deep soil, uh, sunshine. They make big tractors like that make money on the straightaway. They lose money on the turn. It's not very difficult to understand for farmers. Farmers don't understand this. This island here, half the island is is, is uh, um, lava. And then where the deep soil, there's ravines and whatever. So we're, the characteristic of farmers here are small farmers. Now what we're, what it's looking like to me is we're taking what's happening in, in, in Iowa and inserting it on top of us. Um, that's a wrong analogy. So that, that, that's the first thing. The second thing is, we all know, it was in the paper, um, <laughs> farmers are getting older. The average farmer is getting older. 62 years old, the average farmer. Why is that? Food security has to do with this. If the farmers make money, the farmers will farm. Why are they getting older? Because young people cannot make money. That, that just bottom line is not very complicated. The, your plus has got to exceed your minuses. Well, you got to get out and choose something else to do. And that applies to our food. The most important thing we can do is our food. Now, imagine this. A farmer at the dinner table talking to his kids, wondering what to tell them. Should they go into farming or should we plan on selling? You know what the dinner table conversation is right now in this atmosphere? It's get out. I'm sorry. Thank you. All right, now we've identified quite a few negative aspects of this. Let's let's turn our thinking, and I encourage all of you to do the same. What would it take 
what issues do we have to identify and, and be able to solve? What are the issues that we need to be able to solve before we would feel comfortable with um, using genetically modified crops? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I knew that was going to happen. I get so excited about what we're talking about. Okay, so we're going to let you guys go first, and you get a chance. Uh, you can talk over who's going to do the rebuttal, and you folks can decide who's going to do the rebuttal for what we just discussed on worst fears. Okay, one of you two. Who's going to? Who wants to speak on this side? Okay. He was just we're identifying worst fears. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, you know who's going to talk for the two of you? Okay. All right. Well, let's see if you go first. Um, okay. Um, a lot of the discussion goes to where's the science and who is the science? And folks say to me, um, okay, Margaret, you got it. Maybe this is unscientific and you're not being progressive and we have to look towards the future. but. Really, from examining this issue um, more in depth, I really feel that, that we are being scientific. We are looking at what the precautionary principle is in our state constitution. We're just trying to act cautiously. That's not anti-scientific, act cautiously. And really, what I see as um, who's sort of anti-science, I, I look over and say, well, if you're so pro-science, why do you want that exemption from long-term scientific studies, from health and, and safety studies? Let them do it, do it. Allow, promote independent thinking. Um, promote those. Don't um, hide behind our patent laws, our intellectual property laws, and saying you can't do an independent study because I have a patent, I'm not giving you the information, and therefore there's no, you can't do any study. You also have, um, discrediting every any scientist that attempts to um, do an independent study. I mean, it, it's they're very um, litigious. They're very good at um, discrediting. They have um, you know enormous funds to go after uh, whether it's a, a regulator or a um, uh, a scientist that finds some other um, that doesn't go along with them. Or, such as the one, there was an International Bee Institute um, and bought, at, bought it, that out. So you have, um, I also just want to say on the toolbox issue, it's we don't want to get where the right to farm is the right to harm your neighboring property owner. Tools are good, but not at the point where they're, you are harming the other's livelihood. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you folks have a chance to read what these folks have said. Okay. Uh, you know, when we, you know, you talk about irreversible damage, what are we looking at as to irreversible damage? There's a lot of words that are constantly said, irreversible damage, especially to the young. It harms the young. The American Pediatric Society endorsed the safety of GMO crops of commercially GMO crops. The bad ones were weeded out in the review process. And you know, talking about liabilities in terms of that inadvertently growing GM crops, the growers were sued. Anyone can show me the lawsuit where Monsanto, DuPont, Syngenta went after the person inadvertently growing. The ones that they went after were blatant misuse of patented products. Over 50% of their harvested crop was GM. That is not a mixture. They had where people went out there, they grew GM crop, they sold the seed to the feed mill or the seed, the flower, grain mill, and they bought the seed back and planted that. They went out there, they sprayed Roundup on their crop to say, oh, we wanted to see how, how much of it was you know, GM crops. So, the companies, Monsanto, DuPont, they only go after the people who are blatantly misusing their material, not the small guys. And in terms of seeds, you can buy seeds. Why do people buy seeds from the major seed companies, Monsanto, DuPont, the large 
How many of you like to grow second best, third best? How many of you like to spend more money on your crop? Farmers need to make money. And they try to cut corners or they try to save money any way they can. And if it's true technology, they will do it. Thank you. Excellent. Um, now, when we get down to the point now where we have to really identify what the issues are. What are the issues? Let's get it down into concise terms so that we can all understand what we're talking about and we're all on the same page. What issues are there that you would want to see addressed before you would feel comfortable with using genetically modified crops on this island? Okay? And we'll start, let's see, we're going to start with you folks this time. Okay, Richard? <clears throat> Obviously, it's safety. Yeah? The safety issue has got to be addressed. And from the farmer's point of view, it's... Uh, they have to go with the science because that's the the the, the, uh, the the solid basic foundation from which to make decisions. So it has to be um, um, safety. But you know, I, I as a, as a farmer, and I'm I'm here because I belong to this group called the uh, um, Hawaii Farmers and Ranchers United, and we produce more than ninety percent of the farm value produce of this island. And everybody in that group feels the same way as what I'm saying. Yeah. And everybody's very concerned about the, the future viability of farms and the ability to, to grow food, because that's the number one thing that we're interested in, food security. Um, There's a whole bunch of uh, issues that, that, that revolves around this, and as we're talking about uh, GMO specifically, that's, that's a really narrow view of things. The bigger picture is, what is going to happen to us as a society? Because over, and, and the big uh, gorilla in the room is energy, and ag and energy is inextricably tied together. And just last week, uh, the Energy Information Agency said that two-thirds of our uh, Oil reserve does not exist because what we thought we had in the Monterey Shell, 96% of it doesn't exist. So we said we had 100 years worth of it. Well, two thirds went, so we only got 34. 34 years of technically recoverable reserves. If you got $100, a million dollars a barrel, you ought to get 34 years. If you got $150 a barrel, how many years have we got left? Now that is real serious because what we're talking about is we're talking about um, the consequence to the rubber slipper folks, the folks that on the lowest rungs of the economic ladder. Because now in our uh, economic system, the folks that get pass, it, pass on the cost will pass it on. And it drops all the way down, then it ends up at the folks with um, um, fixed income, the kupuna, um, single moms, working homeless, that kind, that kind of thing. So what we need to do is we need to look at the big picture. And right now, we're, we're not looking at the big picture. Because, like I said, for the first thing I just said was, if we take care of the safety issue first, then we can start to talk about the bigger picture. And it's really important that we talk about the big, bigger picture. Because we're kind of circling around right, right there and not making any progress. Well, the top most uh, important, you know, issue would be like with when we introduce any type of uh, new crop here in Hawaii, whether it's a, a food crop, ornamental crop, that we need to be sure that it will not become a weed species as being defined by the checklist used for invasive species. You know, not willingly decide, oh, I don't like that because it's GMO, it's going to become a weed. No, there is a specific set as to how much seed it produces, whether it survives, whether it reproduces. So we need to be sure, yes, any crop, you know. I know in, on the Big Island, uh, about a decade or more ago, California poppies, beautiful crops, 
you can grow it beautifully in your garden, but uh, we wanted to, to ban the seeds. We told the post office that no, they couldn't put it in their seed packets of wildflowers because it naturalizes, it grows. I agree with that. We shouldn't bring in things that will naturalize and that shouldn't be here. Also, one of the top issues, you know, how much scientific consensus or evidence do we need before we accept GM crops as being acceptable or not acceptable? We cannot keep raising the bars saying that, well, we're against multinational seed corporation who control 90% of the seed, or we don't like it because it's pesticide, because it kills bees. You know, what level are we going to accept you know, to stabilize, we need to discuss that and to talk about that to say, hey, we have scientific organizations stating it is safe. We have some independent scientists saying it's not. <coughs> How much evidence do we say? Do we keep following the people who check to see if the world's flat because there are a few people that says the world is flat? Or man did not go to the moon? You know, there are always going to be groups of naysayers out there. So what level of proof do we need before people can consider GMO crops safe? Thank you. And what is the most important for us to resolve? I think I would like to uh, state emphatically that there is no consensus about the safety of genetically modified crops. Uh, whenever you open a review article, a scientific review article, one of the first statements is, this hasn't been done before, or we don't know about it, or we don't know what are the, what, what are the, there's considerable debate in all aspects of the science of genetically modified crops, especially with the risk concerning the many unknowns and unintended consequences. A lot of the government agencies that come up and say GMOs are safe, like the World Health Organization or the Academy of Pediatrics, these government business agencies have not conducted the research themselves. Whenever you go down to who conducted the research, it always comes down to the companies, to the industry. This research is kept from public preview. The public cannot, does not have access to this research to determine whether this is a good data or bad data. Uh, we know that a lot of these agencies or groups are captured by the interest of big of, 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 of industry, either because they get funding or because they are aligned to the interests of the United States. Uh, what happened when UNICEF decided to teach sexual education back in the 1980s, the United, which is a United Nations agency, the United States took funding away from UNICEF for several years. Uh, so all these agencies have to work in, in stand in line to say yes, these crops are, are safe to continue that flow of funding or be a part of that uh, consensus. So emphatically, there's no consensus. I should indicate there has not been one single study in Hawaii to determine the health, safety of genetically modified crops that we're consuming in the state. There has not been one single study in Hawaii to determine any potential environmental impacts from the crops that we have been growing here for the past 15 years. Uh, the creator of the gene papaya says, talk is cheap. Well, so far, all we have heard are words of claims of safety, words of, we say, the papaya industry. When you look for the data, there has been no data that has been pushed for, put forward to show the safety of these crops, or their environmental, or the economic benefits that they have contributed to, uh, to, the, to the state. In, this, in essence, what you need when you will release a new crop are clinical type studies. Uh, when you release a new drug, you conduct clinical type studies with animals based on long-term studies, multi-generational studies, to determine whether there are side effects. Some of the, many of the studies that have been conducted today have indeed shown harm on several body organs uh, from the consumption of uh, GMOs. Thank you. Okay, um, you know, the, this whole phrase, the, the consensus that GMO is safe, um, for me, is like propaganda. You say it enough, you say it enough, you say it enough. Somebody's 
going to finally get it through. We just keep saying it, we put it out there. And yet, I just want, if someone wants to take a look and at a list of studies that say there's adverse health effects from crop biotechnology, can get a copy of this. Um, on every page of study. Here's, this one is environmental risk from crop biotechnology, selected literature citations. Now, I'm not going to say every test comes out unsafe, but I'm just saying, put yourself in my position as a government official. What should I do if there's science on either side, where there is the potential for great harm, not just for ourselves, but for our kids, for their generation? For me, that it should be caution. Um, I am also looking around the world. Here we have what's happening on Kauai, what's happening in Mexico, in Latin America. Why is Peru, Colombia, countries saying no more? That the communities where it's GMO crops, the communities are ill. But whereas there's not, and there's not that monoculture, they're not ill. Why is it that there's dust storms where you get the sterile soil? So you look around. And again, do we just jump ahead or do we again be cautious and that's what we're trying to do here. The other islands are more dominated, this one isn't. And that's why I sort of feel, well let us be the model. You know, you can have a control in an experiment. Um, let's be that. Let's, um, we can take advantage of the, the economy. The world is turning away from GMOs. You know, can't we be, uh, you sort of ride on that wave and be ahead and, and provide for that. Even if there is, you know, there are, um, you know, there may be different things that are safe, but why don't we you know, really maximize that, um, that niche? Um, and to say that these companies, it's only outrageous cases where there's litigation, that's not true. And these are good lawyers. I tell you, I am so impressed. They do such a good job. I just, um, they have a barn full, a uh, field full of attorneys that are good. And that's a great deal of power. We had one person come and testify in Kona that he and his crop is organic papaya. He suddenly realized that some of them were GMO. He cut every single tree down out of fear of, um, of being sued. And you can say, no, that they're not. No, they're not. But what happens in the lawsuits that came up? The company said, if there's only, if there's less than 1%, we won't sue. And the, and, um, the patent laws are very strict. There's strict liability. It doesn't care whether you meant to grow them or not. They own your crop. They own your profits. Okay, now it's time for two-minute rebuttals. Um, so again, I'd like to talk among yourselves and decide who's going to speak to the rebuttals on this. And um, let us know, and we'll start with uh, the pro-GMO position. Okay, who's going to speak for the rebuttal? Okay. Um, you know, farmers, uh, now we're talking about the pig iron, yeah? and we, uh, it's important that we concentrate on the pig iron. Um, farmers here don't necessarily buy um, seeds from uh, big um, multinational companies. A lot of them buy from Taiwan. Why? Because they're on the same land. <coughs> um, there's a whole bunch of different places we buy seeds from. I myself don't grow any GMO uh, crops, but there, there's a whole bunch of choices that we have. So you know, to make make farmers look like uh, they're they're like uh, inept or pretty pretty uninformed is not is not right, you know. Because what the farmers are doing, they're trying to, to to get the best characteristic possible for the money they're paying. So like in our case, we grow uh, uh, high spawning tomatoes. We, we tested 40, 50, 100 varieties. I don't know how much. And in our particular case, we're looking for certain things, mainly taste. Now, um, each farmer makes their decision based on how they think, what their product um, is going to do for them economically, because they, they really need to make ends meet. If not, they got to quit. And this is really what we're talking about. You know, the farmers, um, we, we got to look at farmers like they're real people. They, they, they have mortgages, they have kids, they got to send those kids to school. Um, and they're, only 2% of the people, the, 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 um, people actually farm and, so, and feed everybody. And here in the U.S., you know, like, it's pretty amazing that we have so much um, uh, 
food. You know, actually, it, it's as if we, our hunting takes place in the supermarket. You know, I mean, um, anyway, and that, I, I just wanted to say that um, the farmers, let's, let's all take a hard look at what the farmers have to go through. Thank you, and who's going to speak on this side of here? One of the points that I would like to, to bring up is that the claim that those that are promoting uh, GM crops are on the side of science. And I imagine that assumes that anybody that asks questions about the safety is uh, not on the side of science or even worse, is, is anti-science. We have to recall that the industry that the first brought up this issue was the tobacco industry. Uh, they started to conduct and promote research to try to discredit studies that shown that were showing the harmful effects of tobacco on secondhand smoking. And the tobacco industry came up with the concept of sound science and also with the concept of junk science. Uh, and pretty much everybody that agreed with the research that they were conducting were conducting sound science and those that were saying there's some kind of harm about tobacco is, is, is considered junk science. And this thinking, this PR strategy, was moved on to other types of industries, uh, such as the awesome layer, asbestos, and, and, and now with, with genetically modified crops. One of the main problems with the industry so far with genetically modified crops is that they have not been able to contain their products within their own farms. And this involves both the genetic information as well as as well as the pesticides uh, that they are using to grow these crops. Wherever GM crops are being grown in the world, there has been problems of contamination. So when we have discussed what can we do to accept GM crops, we have to accept the fact that coexistence is possible. But so far, this has not happened anywhere in the world. Uh, the, problem, the question then comes in terms of liability. If you contaminate your crop, as we have seen it on and on with the papaya industry, including 20% of the feral papayas in the streets, who is liable? Who will pay for that? And so far, nobody has been able to step up and say that we will. Good. You guys are doing really well judging your time. OK, now we need to move to what misconceptions do you think the general public has? What misconceptions do you hear uh, when you talk to people in the community about genetically modified crops? And this time we'll start with the folks on this side of the table. We'll, let's start with Hector this time and then go to Margaret. Okay. Um, well, this is, a, this is the next question. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Let's start. Let's make it. Uh, let's give you two minutes on this. Uh, the first misconception is the uh, purported enemies of the uh, benefits of the GM industry in the state. We often see data of 200 million or over 200 billion contributed to the state. This is actually data that is provided by the industry to the Department of Agriculture and then they report it as fact. And as far as I know, this has not been vetted in, uh, independently in terms of comparing benefits versus, versus cost of having this industry in the state. Uh, another misconception is that the government is actually doing its job. Uh, when you go to the grocery store and you buy a product, cornflakes or cereal, you assume this has been vetted by the government. And the more we look into it, we realize that in many cases, uh, the government has simply uh, is looking the other way. Another misconception, uh, and this is touted internationally, is the purported success of the uh, rainbow papaya industry in the state. Uh, there have been many claims that have been made that we saved the industry, uh, everything uh, went, would have not been possible without the GMO papaya. And once again, to repeat what I said earlier, uh, we have not been able to see the data to back up those statements in terms of economic benefits or in terms of uh, if they actually consider alternative ways of managing uh, these, these diseases in, in, in Hawaii. Uh, in essence, the papaya, GM papaya, has been used as the poster child to promote the benefits of the GM industry internationally. And it's being used right now in California and in Florida to promote the next generation of GM crops, which will be uh, genetically modified uh, or oranges. We mentioned earlier, uh, 
thought that is being touted by industry and by scientists that genetic modification is the same as the traditional breeding that we have been doing for years and years, and that nothing could be further from the truth. The GMOs is a, is a totally different concept that we have not done in the past. Thank you, Margaret. We'll take questions. Um, I think one of from a lawyer's point of view, I think the misconception that the federal government or the state government is addressing this issue and adequately handling it. Um, basically, the federal government defers to the industry. Plus, it's completely, it's infiltrated, I would say infiltrated, but um, many of those who are in key positions are from the biotech industry. Um, even on the international level, you take a look at the Trans-Pacific Partnership and some of the what's been leaked out about the um, concessions to the Monsanto and other biotechs, such that if you have local laws that um, harm their profits, they can go to a confidential secret body that would repay them. Um, so, or on the state level, this whole year, or I spent a lot of my time sort of focusing on the home rule issue because the state wanted to trumpet and say the county cannot have any say so on whether it was uh, health or welfare of the people or in particular agriculture. And yet the state does nothing to regulate GMOs. So it was that the counties can do nothing, but we're going to leave these companies above the law. And we even pass laws to say that they cannot be sued. Um, on the on the um, federal patent law level, you can bring, if you buy GMO seeds and they don't work, your remedies are to go to Missouri and sue. You cannot sue here in Hawaii. And you can, your maximum remedy is the price of the seeds. You're totally um, skewed the level of power. You're dealing with something that's very, very powerful and is really dominating much of the world. And I think as little communities, have to build a model. We can do better. Thank you. Right. And misconceptions as far as GMOs. Yeah. I'm here to represent the small farmers because one problem that we have is that the small farmers feel threatened. You know why? Because we live on an island. We gotta sell to wholesalers, we gotta sell to retailers. We cannot drive across the country and sell someplace else. So, so the farmers are kind of in a, in a bind. So, but I can see what, what how farmers feel. They, um, who's going to feed all of us? We, we rely on the farmers. But the way we're talking is, is, is you, you know, farmers are out there farming because it, it's not only about making money, obviously. Yeah? Farmers get out there making money. So it's, it's, it's basically uh, something that's inside of you. But you know this kind of discussion that's going around, and when it comes back to the farmers that are not so smart because they're being taken advantage of by the big seed company, that's not true, you know. What it is, is farmers have real good common sense. And this is what I mean by farmers have common sense. It's a sense of the commons of the farmers. They gotta do stuff on time, or you lose your crops. When you gotta go, you gotta go. They don't fool around wasting time. They go and do the stuff. So that's how farmers are. And it's very worrisome to think that, um, we, I don't think we really give farmers credit for what they do. What I consider, you know, misconceptions or misunderstanding about the GMO issue is the way people look at data and how they draw correlations between what they term cause and effect. They place a cause at an effect when none exists. Does GMO causes harm? No. At least to me, it does not. Yeah, I think the microphone just ran out. Yeah, we've got the other one standing by. Oh, I actually ran. But, you know, looking at there, the cause and, and effect, 
I can accept if there is truly data that shows GMO. I'd be the first one to say, ban GMO. I have done GMO research. I know what goes into getting something registered just to do a field trial, what it takes to get it into the greenhouse. We look at each case individually. It's not a blanket type of, uh, okay, you got the paperwork in. It is very specific. Where does the pollen go? Does it escape? What uh, crops or what wild species are there out there that can be pollinated. So it is a long and drawn out form that needs to be uh, completed. And there is safety, there is uh, checks and balances in there. And if you truly believe that there isn't, there's nothing that I can say, Richard can say, or scientists can say in general that will convince people that they are checks and balances. Okay. So let's uh, have one minute each for a rebuttal and uh, talk again among yourselves about who's going to take the rebuttal part of this. And we'll start with you folks this time to rebut. So who wants to speak to the rebuttal on anything that you heard on the other position over here? Yeah, I, I keep on coming back to the farmers, you know, and, and, and the farmers, um, first of all, no, nobody here, hardly anybody is using GMO, you know, we're only talking about papayas and, and uh, corn, but what about the rest of us? We're talking about just everybody, it's not everybody, but, you know, uh, just Last week, there was an article about bananas, uh, Fusarium wilt in bananas, we found in um, um, uh, off the coast of Africa. It was a chiquita plantation. And, and the Fusarium wilt spread all the way through the, the plantation. Now, they had people going back and forth from, from uh, uh, plantation in, in Africa to, to, to Central America. You know what? They probably got, got the disease now. Now, the two ways of going through this, one is by GMO or selective breeding. Are we gonna say no use GMO? I think that's foolish. All right, and who's going to revive? All right. Okay, so I'm Margaret Willie. And um, we are here on the level of the farmers, but I wanna say that everyone on this island is a stakeholder in this decision. No matter who you are, whether it's from the point of view of what you eat, whether it's from a neighboring property owner, whether it's the reef, um, whether it's the butterflies, whether it's the bees that consider all of this land to be a desert. Um, we are a web of life and we have to take that into consideration and harm not just our immediate harm or our economic benefit in the short term. I think Hector spent a lot of time in terms of agroecology, that is the well-being economic well-being, long-term, social, cultural, and uh, environmental. Um, I just want to say in terms of the future of farming, part of that is being excited and being part of something great. Actually here at UH, this year, in the past few years, there's suddenly the very way higher it, um, attendance here and excitement and being part of something and a future. Um, I think we have a big future. <laughs> <laughs> big model. Very good. You guys are doing great. Okay. So um, I think I was going to ask another question, and I want to leave you with this question, and then we're going to go to uh, the questions that the audience would like to ask. So just one moment on that. But let me give you a question. Um, what do you think needs to happen in this community? And I'm not asking for your outward answers, but just think about it needs to happen in our community to resolve this issue to bring everyone together to their satisfaction? I don't want answers, but I want you to think about it. No, just think about it. Come down and talk to me afterwards if you have an idea, okay? So if you have a question, so we're still... The last question. Well, I'd like to come back to that. Okay. And uh, right now, let's take some questions from the audience. And we're going to... Uh, Hannah, you want to read the first question and tell us who it's addressed to? And we're, we're going to balance them? Oh, well, I, I, yeah. Okay. 
you know, um, my name's Hannah Wu. I'm the director, basically, for the Women's Center, which is finally full time starting July 1st. Um, anyways, <laughs> one year. Um, anyways, um, I just wanted to. Uh, I picked up. There's so many questions in this audience, right? And I know that we're not going to please 100 percent of the people, right? But I try to get the get the questions that I myself have questions about. Um, you know, like I'm a di I was a dietetics major, studied food, you know, a lot, different kind of, you know, you know, vitamins, chemicals, all this kind of stuff. Um, but what I did to make it fair so that everyone's voice is heard is on the back table as you walk out, you can go and see everybody's questions that they had kind of written down and wanted to know about. Some people made comments on those cards. So, you know, in the spirit of everybody kind of having their voice heard, at least those questions are on the back and you can kind of look at them and some of the, the panels will be after, you know, stay afterwards for a little bit so you can ask some questions if we don't get them all answered. Because um, we could probably be here all night, I mean, if you want. Um, <laughs> so anyways, um, the first one I thought was interesting was, um, uh, this is just, I think just one from the pro and one from the con right. side. That would be great to have just one person answer these questions. Uh, we have about eight, just so you know. Um, so uh, I understand that organic food is never genetically modified. Is that true? And what prevents uh, uh, genetic modification of organically grown crops? So our, the question is, why are, are genetically modified and organic mutually exclusive? Okay. Sure. Can I read the question? Uh, yes. <laughs> Just to make sure. Organic food. Is, this person says organic food is never genetically modified. Are they exclusive? Organic versus GM. Okay. Uh, the, it all comes down to definition. If you can have organic, that is GM, but you cannot have certified organic, that is GM. So there is a difference when you look at the labeling. If you do not want genetically modified crops, you have to look for the certified organic label. You can grow genetically modified crops organically, but you cannot claim that it is certified organic. So, in that sense, it's a definition, and the definition is set by the USDA. So, if you go to the USDA site, search for uh, organic standards, that's where it is. Uh, okay. 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 Just to clarify, uh, if you want to be certified organic or sell a product certified organic, genetically modified organics are not allowed in that, in that product. Uh, I should indicate, if you have been following the issue, that the industry has been trying to dilute the meaning of organic. So at first, the government indeed tried to allow the presence of genetically modified and organic products, and they got about 250,000 letters, and I think it's the largest amount of letters that the government ever got, crit criticizing them for that position, and they had to move it away. But if you follow the industry, you have to be cautious, because the industry is trying to dilute more and more the definition of what organics actually means. Okay, thank you. Now let's move on to the next question, and this one will be, um, for the folks that are well, I think the way we're going to do this is one one from each side, just in, in the interest of time. Yeah. 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 So this one is directed to the. Uh, well, what we'll do is um, like you go first this time, and then the, all the questions I need are kind of in the middle of the room. You're changing the format. So, so, so I just want to get to as many questions as possible. Okay. All right. Okay. Just want to know the class. I just want to know the class. Okay. 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 So. What is uh, the worst intended consequence for a human so far for specifically modified GMO? Just one from each side. So the question is the, the harm that has been shown so, so far. The worst consequence for, me, for a human from a specifically modified GMO. So I have to clarify that the industry of incomes says so far, we have consumed three, three trillion servants, and not a single person has even sneezed from having eaten GMO crops. And I have heard the same comments from GMO papaya. Nobody ever got sick from GMO papaya. The fact is that we have not conducted post-marketing studies 
uh, to determine if anybody has actually been harmed. When we produce the release drugs into the market, we conduct post-marketing studies, and eventually about 50% of those drugs are pulled out or the label is redrawn. Based on animal studies, there are several dozen studies that have shown that feeding animals GM crops harms several body or of their body organs. Uh, some of those, ma many of those studies have been criticized or say they are not valid, but nobody has come back and repeated those studies to verify whether they are valid or not. Uh, so there has not been follow-up, uh, such as by the work of PUSAI that was conducted back in 1999. Do you want to rebut what he has just said? One minute. Okay. Uh, to me, that you know, looking at GM crops, uh, has it harmed humans? I guess that was the question. To me, it's anxiety. It's created a lot of anxiety in a lot of people. What is true? What is false? As to whether it caused bodily harm in animals that fed on GM crops. I would say categorically, no, it has not. The studies have not been able to be reproduced in any other labs. It has been done once. It has been discounted by nearly every scientific organization. It has been retracted by the journal that published it. Science is a self-correcting process that if it is found to be in error, it will be pulled, it will be changed, it will be stricken from the records. Thank you. So, on the flip side of that, what are the benefits of GMOs? What are the benefits of GMOs? So we can start. What are the benefits, the possible benefits of GMO? Who would like to respond to that? One and one. One minute. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm not a scientist, as everybody knows. But, so let me just throw out something that people would use all the time, uh, cause and effect. Just recently, not, not too many months ago, there was an article in the paper that said that uh, Hawaii has the longest life expectancy in a nation, quality of life and life expectancy for senior citizens, and we have the highest per capita consumption of papaya. We are the guinea pigs. I think it's looking at Kauai and looking around and you see all of this immune suppression, all of this gut harm. Um, and if I were to then turn around and say, okay, what are the benefits? Well, there's short-term economics for those who, who use them and, and quick shortcut and destroy the land and, well, we're going to make money right now and that tends to be the way instead of what is our obligation, a public trust to look for not just the moment, not just us, but for future generations. We're part of something much greater and we should be a model of that. So. Um, <laughs> so that's where, um, in terms of what I see as a benefit, is a benefit for the, the investors in uh, GMO products and in GMO companies and those who take advantage of, of others and don't and disregard and, and fight against having uh, scientific health and safety studies. Okay, thank you. All right, Anna, one more. Um, so this kind of. Uh, this one's, uh, many people talked about this, and so I just tried to condense it a bit, but, you know, kind of, uh, it kind of stems into the last question, but how do we address the bigger issue of mass food production? Um, if GMOs are not the route, you know, what do, you know, where do we go? Okay. Well, all right, let's, let's go ahead and let this side answer first. All right. yeah. Okay, if you were around here last week, we had a conference here and got all groups together in Ag Forum on a lot of these same questions. What do we do for the health of the soil? What do we do as alternatives for uh, feedstock? Um, what do we do in terms of the little red fire ant? That here we are and we basically bring 
farming down to the level of the community and not in terms of the control of the multinational chemical corporations and have empower ourselves and not be subject and basically be a serf that when you sign that agreement, you're going to be a patent licensee. I don't see you're a farmer anymore. You're a patent licensee. You have you open your farm your crops, your farmland to that entity, you that patent holder, you open your books to them. You're basically you press that button, I agree to this uh, patent this uh, manual for production. Yeah, so so us farmers uh, uh, we're gonna go in um, just be taking uh, advantage of my seed companies. We, we, we have choices of what, what we want to plant. Yeah, and it, it, it happens all the time over here. Now, and, and another thing, we're talking like, you know, something bad is happening right here. We're talking about the big oven. There's only uh, papaya and corn here. Everything else is non-GMO. We sounded like we we're just uh, all dummies. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, I'm sorry, bad choice of words. Um, but farmers, farmers are not uh, ignorant. This is this is what happened when I got into farming. I was smarter than everybody, and I, I was invisible. And little by little, I started to realize, holy smokes, I didn't see it. It's under the microscope. So I, I had to go ask the experts. It didn't take me very long to figure out that the folks at the university are experts, the scientists. That's why the the, the, the farmers go to scientists. Common sense, the short direction. The short direction. <coughs> All right, thank you. Can I have one more, please? All right. Here. Uh, the next question I thought was interesting, um, because I was wondering myself, but do GMOs pollute the water? Um, they were uh, talking about a study in China where they found a gene for antibacterial resistance in every major river in China. Um, do they pollute the water? Okay, so let's start. Sorry. Do you want to take that one? So the question is, do genetically modified crops pollute the water? Okay. Antibacterial resistance. Oh, which antibacterial resistance? Antibacterial resistance, yeah. Does it break your immune system down because there's... Can you state it again? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. <clears throat> so, do you most pollute the water? There's a study in China that found there was a gene for antibacterial resistance. So basically, it breaks down your immune system, right? And that was found in every river in China. Is that well, is that valid? Is it too different those GM crops, uh, you know, contaminating water? Maybe the pesticides from it. I would yes. say, if uh, used incorrectly, yes. It can pollute the water, like with any other pesticide, whether it comes in a spray can that you use in your home, home remedies that you use, sulfur, can contaminate bodies of water. That's why you read the label and you follow label directions. Uh, as for yes. antibacterial genes, <laughs> yes. Uh, there's reports all over the world of antibacterial, you know, or bacterial cycle genes resistance it, it is uh, it occurs anytime you use any type of compound that fights bacteria bacteria fights back you know it's a matter of survival somebody tries to suppress you you will fight back also survival of the fittest I, I mentioned this earlier and part of the problem is that the industry has been unable to contain their products so you harvest your corn, you take the year away, but the plant remains in the soil. There's rain, there's runoff. That those grains, those residues, move into the ocean, move into aquatic habitats. Studies and surveys that have been conducted so far have found DNA from Roundup Ready corn or DNA from BT crops have been found in the soil, aquatic habitats, and this DNA has been able to persist for many for, for a long time. The, the, the risk is that this DNA is going to interact with other organisms in the environment and create a third level of organism to create a new disease or another organism. Uh, six, this BT antibiotic marker was found in six of the major rivers in China, and the concern is that when you, you get sick, you go to the clinic, uh, the medicine is no longer going to work because you have been exposed to this level of antibiotic markers. 
Uh, this is again called unintended consequences. Okay. Uh, so what, right? No, it's not a somewhat question. Let's look at you know from from a science you know level. Where did the BT gene come from? Everything you're saying is probably it came from the soil bacteria. So don't be rude. You know, like it or not, that's where we find it. It is a soil bacterium. It is the mainstay of organic farmers for the past 50 years. It's the same protein, whether you use it organically or is it produced in a GM crop. It is the same protein. There is no difference. All right. Uh, now, at this point, um, I know there are lots more questions, but... Uh, you want to ask this last yeah, one? Yeah, I want to ask this, this right. last one. Okay. So, okay. I just try to filter through these, and I think this is like the good kind of wrap-up one here. But uh, so, you know, we talked a lot about GMOs, and I think you know I do a lot of training on social justice, diversity, racism, and you all are doing pretty good <laughs> so far. Okay, so far. All right. So the question, last one is: What are the consequences of banning GMOs on the Big Island? And why would we want GMOs if there was uh, even a slight chance of harm? Uh, and this person just cited that 60 plus countries have banned GMOs. So the question is, what is the consequences of banning GMOs on the Big Island? Okay, you don't want to um, who went last? Okay. Well, <laughs> it, it puts us in a different economic position and we would be a model for the world. Um, I do think in terms of negative is that there are a lot of people that are in the papaya business that are um, doing GMO papaya and that's why like um, the bill that I proposed or we got passed and the mayor signed it was to make it so that there's some balance is that no one um, we grandfathered in. We grandfathered in the entire industry of papaya. Um, in, in my view um, the corn is another question because it's wind pollinated and therefore I really feel it would be great if, if that Ocala dairy you know, switched over. Um, but I felt that it was really trying to find that balance and therefore um, contrary to some uh, others I proposed and worked on doing what I felt was a balance. Let's hold where we are and um, consider further before we allow any further GMOs. You know, the ban on the big island only applies to the big island. So the other islands could, could use um, various uh, biotech solutions. And what would happen to us growing the same crop? We'd be at a disadvantage. So that, 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 that is a problem. What, where's the disadvantage? Wait, what are you talking about? Hey, come on, um, come on, please. Please, please, let him. I can't stand it. Well, then why don't you step out? We'll have somebody come and address it. We'll, we'll come and address your question. Yeah, so, so it gives, uh, it gives the, the farmers here a competitive disadvantage. It's just a reality. Yeah. Um, yeah, one more thing I'd like to say. The, uh, yeah. um, okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Yeah, we need. Pardon? Yeah, you want to. Well, do we already know that? Where are we? I think we've. Yeah, we did. Yeah, Margaret did talk to that one. Okay. All right. All right. So let's. Uh, it's getting late. It's five after six, and I'd like to have us have an opportunity to close. So what I'd like to do is come back to that question of what would it take, uh, you know, for us to resolve this issue in our community? What needs to happen here in our community to resolve this issue for the good of everyone concerned? And since these folks went first, we'll let you be first to the last. So are we doing like one minute each? Or yeah, one, you're going to each have uh, one, let's give you one minute each, and this, these will be okay, closing yeah, comments as well. Okay, so this is one minute each, and any closing comments you'd like to make in terms of where from here, where from here. Okay. Again, I think we're talking about the future of agriculture on the Big Island. And I think this is part of the democratic process. Uh, we are having a community discussion, and I often say that we should have had this discussion 20 years ago 
before we introduce this technology without the knowledge of the public. This is basically a community decision, a community dialogue, and the community comes together and makes a decision, we're gonna go route A or route B. The communities so far all over the world are saying, we are not happy with what's going on with genetically modified crops. GM crops are grown basically only in four countries in the world. Only 27 country growers grow it in the world out of 196. Most of the food is being grown by small farmers feeding about 70% of the world using local small farmer agroecological techniques. Thank you. How to resolve? I think start by enforcing the law, the ordinance that we passed, and making sure that state legislators or anyone else doesn't undermine it, whether it's through the courts or otherwise. Um, I also think again we are at a pivotal point. You know, it is, and this is an important discussion, and we're all here. We all care about the island, and we're all looking at it. And I think that when we say um, no, as I said, anti-GMO, it's really what are we for? We, you know, we're for something that's eco-friendly, that we want to be part of nature, that we want to be around, that we want to preserve this for the future. I think we also need to reverse liability burdens in the meantime. It should be strictly a liability for polluting and contaminating someone else's um, land. We also need to put money into research of alternatives. Um, and again, we need to have look at biodiversity and the environment and the web of life and have a community-based agriculture here and not multinational. Yeah. 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 I'll let you two gentlemen have a chance also to have the last words here, okay? So where do you think we should go from here? Okay, thank you. Um, I think we all agree that we, we, uh, we're looking for the betterment of future generations, you know? And we also want to make sure that we are able to feed ourselves because I mentioned about the oil stuff. We got we gotta make sure we're able to feed ourselves over here. And cost is is a concern, there's no question about it. Um, so looking into the future, what we really need to have all of us together, the most important thing we gotta have is the Aloha spirit. We cannot we cannot lose that as we move forward. Okay. So what what I think we need to do to to to, to write what what uh, we all have, have a um, uncomfortable feeling about is I think we need to go back and sit down and have a discussion about what this what this whole thing should look like because right now we're banning uh, open air um, uh, testing bananas I just told you about the virus out in the world bananas no more pollen why is that down what about tomatoes tomatoes spotted wheels okay so it's allowed if there's an emergency. But if the emergency, uh, as we discuss it, and we say, okay, there's an emergency, you can use it. In the meantime, we're gonna make decisions. It's either we're gonna out of business, or we're gonna use the stuff, and commit to planting something we don't know about, because it, it's last minute. What happened to this, this new junk? Yeah, I think that at least to me, the way we need to resolve the issue is that we need to, you know, come to some acceptance and respect for all forms of agriculture. We're here to feed everyone, not to pick and choose how we farm, where we farm, but to work, learn how to work together. You know, I offer as an example, uh, months back we had a papaya workshop. Some of you in this room helped sponsor it. Some of you attended the workshop. What we had was we had the, the uh, molecular uh, geneticist plant breeder come and talk about the pile, talk about how the GMO was formed, how it was tested, how you can test your plants, where you can test your plants. You know, it was successful. We can help, you know, move agriculture forward. And, you know, I just like to, you know, leave you, you know, do we, you know, stop evolving? Do we evolve naturally, or do we take control of our evolution? Thank you. Naturally. Naturally. Thank you. Okay, and thanks to all of you. I think we live in a very wonderful place where everybody really has the same things in mind. And please, let's give a hand to all of these folks for doing well.
very much.